There is but, a fundamental problem, though, <coughs> with this, since this is a little bit philosophical here, right? So it's the problem with this constructing a physical theory that describes the origin of the universe, right? I mean, so just, just a tiny bit of history here. This is one of the oldest, well, religious, right, questions because lots of different religions in the whole world and throughout history came up with some narrative of creation, the creation myths, right? And there are lots of them. We know of a few are very popular in the West, but they're we not the We have the, the best one, one, the Big Bang. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you don't want to call it a creation myth. Do you? <laughs> that won't know. get you a grant. Um, <laughs> but, but the point, though, is that uh, what has happened is that there is an issue in philosophy which is called the problem of the first cause, right? And, and philosophers have gone around this by usually kind of bringing into the game something which is not caused. So the idea is this, like if you, we're all here sitting here tonight, right? But then you start asking, well, while I'm here, well, because I signed up. And, and then you start, well, when was that? Well, I was doing this and that was my birthday. My parents were born, my grandparents and blah, 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 blah. If you keep asking questions backwards, you go to the beginning, to the first cause, the cause that started all the causes, which in our case, we call it the initial conditions, right, of the Big Bang, so to speak. So this is something that, for example, Aristotle was worried about, right? So he came, he came up with this notion called the unmoved mover. So the unmoved mover was the thing, thing entity that could move without moving. So it was a deity, some sort of divine force there that would import, you know, impact motion in his cosmos from the outside in. And the problem is that we have been dealing with this issue of first cause forever, right? And cosmology, modern cosmology, made this question scientific. We now have actually a scientific way of asking this question. Can we come up with a model where we can describe the beginning of the universe? And people have done that, right? There are the boundary, there are several different kinds of boundary conditions, meaning the beginning of everything started with some assumption that can trigger the universe, right? Out of nothing, and this nothing is extremely qualified. If you're here in the first debate, I hope people talked about that. There is no such thing as nothing in physics, right? But, but the point I'm trying to make is that even if you come up with a theory, a physical theory that describes the beginning of the universe, that theory was built upon a whole conceptual framework, energy, conservation laws, maybe general relativity and quantum physics, and these theories are taken for granted in order for us to begin to be able to talk about something. Well, let, let, me, let me just see if right. I understand what, are you suggesting that this modern scientific effort to explain everything is basically a new version of what religious thinkers used to do? Is this just sort of, uh, Religion 2.0 nice. in, in the guise of physics. <laughs> I love that. Well, in a certain sense, yes, with a very fundamental difference, right? The very fundamental, I mean, the impetus to try to understand everything and to explain everything is, is, very, is very human, right? And, yeah. and I think the reason why people buy more books about cosmology than about laser physics is because we, are, we want to understand, we want to share this knowledge somehow, right? But the difference essentially is what Katie was talking about before, which is testability. Actually, you said that. Experiments, first yeah. thing, greatest idea. So in physics, ultimately, nature is the judge. You can come up with any crazy idea you want. If it is confirmed by a series of experiments and it can be reproducible, then we rubber stamp and say, yeah, this is good as long as it doesn't get broken down later on. So, so, so Max, do you, do you see a connection between yeah. uh, the religious impulse and the scientific impulse? I, I completely impulse? agree with Marcello that, that, the, that the basic impetus for asking all these questions which led to the creation myths and all these great religious stories was, of course, the same very curiosity that makes every kid want to think about these things, and, and that, that's the scientific spirit. I, I think the key difference is what you said so nicely there, and the way I, the way I would put it is, as a scientist, it's better to have questions that you can't answer than to have answers that you can't question. Ah, good. <laughs> and um, good <laughs> well, well, we are allowed to question everything. That's very much the point of science. And, and coming back to your question about the, the, uh, and the part about the unmoved mover, there's always been questions we couldn't answer in science. There's always been a frontier of our knowledge, right? 
some distance away. We didn't know what was farther. Then we explored more. We found that we live in a solar system, in a galaxy, etc. And similarly, there was a frontier of our knowledge in time. Isaac Newton, he could figure out, again, where, as I mentioned, where planets were 100 years ago, but he had no idea what made the planets. And we shouldn't sit here and be smart Alex and, and lampoon religious people a 1,000 years ago who thought the, be the best explanation was that someone made the planets, because that was the most plausible explanation available at the time, right? Now, when you can simulate in your computer what happens when you put in a gas cloud and gravity makes the planet, you know, we feel we understand where they came from. But then where did the gas cloud come from? And now, in cosmology, we also know that if you just start with something, everything we see here around us in our universe with our telescope, squished together into an extremely dense and hot state, so it's hotter than the core of the sun, flying apart so fast it doubled its size in under a second, that will, when we simulate it carefully in our computers, evolve into everything we see around here. So we've pushed the frontier of our knowledge now back to a second, and if the theory of inflation turns out to be correct, which we will have to wait and see, uh, we will have pushed our frontier back maybe to the first hundredth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, which is progress. But that's still not the very beginning. And, and finally, is there an unmoved mover that started it all? Well, maybe not, because we've discovered also that a lot of things we thought were fundamental, like the the continuum nature of the water that I was just drinking here, that it's actually made out of some fundamental building blocks. It's actually kind of grainy. It's made of these, these water molecules. We're starting to suspect that actually it's probably the same way with space, maybe even with space and time, that it's actually <coughs> ultimately not continuous and made out of some quantum building blocks of some sort. And it might very well be, as it is in, in the some of this early wave function stuff that Marcello mentioned, that if you go really far back, time as we know it doesn't exist anymore. There is some sort of quantum fuzz where, where time doesn't really have any meaning. And then we actually, that beautifully gets us off the hook. Because we, you can't ask what caused it, what happened before, if there was no before. 